morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we're, we're, we're inaugurating our remote grand rounds. Uh, we are the honor this morning to have a great uh, fellow, Mike, Dr. Michael Hart, who has uh, finished his medical school at Rush University and uh, went to the uh, University of Minnesota and then um, Hennepin County Medical Center for his uh, for training. And we're really proud to have Michael as a, as a fellow with us. And distinguished himself with his interest in heart failure. I think we all respect his knowledge. And this morning, he's going to address us on ECMO and, uh, and ECPR. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for that introduction and good morning. I guess there are pros and cons to this new webinar format. Uh, the pro mainly being that you can watch this from home in your bathrobe if you want, uh, but I guess the con is you can't uh, boo in my face if you hear something you don't like. <laughs> <clears throat> but the show must go on, and so uh, let's jump to this morning's objectives. Uh, so after today, uh, hopefully we can understand the basics of VA ECMO, including its history of use in adults. We wanna review the hemodynamics of cardiogenic shock and VA ECMO identify the common objectives, indications, and contraindications to VA ECMO use and eCPR, and then highlight MHI's approach to eCPR management and experience in its use. So to bring things a little bit closer to home, we'll start with a case. Uh, we have a 50-year-old female Taekwondo instructor for whom 911 was called at the end of class as she was complaining of some dizziness and lightheadedness, uh, maybe some chest discomfort to a bystander, and actually suffered a brief loss of consciousness. On EMS arrival, she was confused and diaphoretic. And unfortunately, at this point, we don't know anything about her past medical history or medications. Objectively, she was vitally stable at this time and had a normal cardiovascular and lung exam, though she was diaphoretic and clammy and again, kind of confused and unable to answer questions appropriately. Initial EMS rhythm strip showed what appears to be atrial fibrillation with significant Q wave development throughout the anterolateral leads and concomitant ST elevation with reciprocal ST depression inferiorly. And thus, with appropriate concern uh, for acute MI, the patient received aspirin and nitroglycerin and was transported emergently to MHI. Unfortunately, en route, she became more obtunded and bradycardic and ultimately lost pulses uh, with initiation of manual CPR as the rig pulled into the ambulance bay. In the emergency department, appropriate AHA ACLS cares ensued, including intubation and mechanical CPR with Lucas device, multiple medications, as you can see listed here, uh, defibrillation attempts for ventricular fibrillation, and now evidence on the monitor. And despite all of these efforts, uh, we're unable to achieve ROSC and she was transported emergently to the cath lab with no perfusing rhythm and no pulse. So where do you go from here when your ACLS algorithm kind of falls short or has no more answers for you? Well, to understand the answer and why it's different now than it was 50 to 60 plus years ago, you really have to go back and look at the advent of cardiac surgery and its growth uh, dependent on the heart-lung machine development. In the 40s and 50s, the growth was slow, uh, for a number of reasons that I'll get to in a moment. Um, but in part, again, because only a few surgeries could really be performed in the absence of cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, contributing to that was the poor results in the 1950s, uh, with a review being released by Dr. Lolohai in the literature of all cardiac surgeries, open heart surgeries, uh, reported in the literature at that time between 1951 and 1955, with 18 different surgeries at six different centers with 17 deaths. And these are just the ones that we know about. And so, as I alluded to, a couple of the reasons for failure, well, there were multiple parties with really limited collaboration at that time. Uh, complex cardiac surgery certainly was still in its infancy. And, you know, that was at least a uh, product of uh, multiple perioperative issues, this including erroneous preoperative diagnosis, a frequent intraoperative air embolism, and just rampant postoperative bleeding. You know, furthermore, there were no institutional review boards until the 1970s. Uh, only the sickest patients were referred. Again, there was no reliable cardiopulmonary bypass apparatus. Uh, 
So as you can imagine, this kind of led to a race to develop such a machine uh, with at least five different groups, um, likely more working on this objective at the same time. Uh, pictured here on your left is the uh, Dowdrill General Motors research pump, uh, which was said to uh, resemble a 12 cylinder engine. And then on the right is your uh, Cowan mustard heart lung machine which actually used a pair of rhesus monkey lungs as the oxygenator. Now, not to be left out of the race, Minnesota soon threw its hat into the ring. Uh, pictured here is the aforementioned Dr. Lilhai, uh, who developed this cross-circulation technique, which actually uses the patient's parents, either mother or father, uh, as the oxygenator during the operation. And after a successful VSD closure, uh, Dr. John Kirkland from Mayo Clinic was quoted as saying, I was terribly envious, and yet I was terribly admiring at the same moment. And that admiration increased when a short time later, a few of my colleagues and I visited Minneapolis and observed a succession of open heart operations. Now, not to be outdone by his neighbors from the north, uh, Dr. Kirkland would set out to develop his own heart-lung machine, really building off the work done by this Dr. John Gibbon, who I want to spend a few moments on. Now, Dr. Gibbon graduated from Jefferson Medical College in 1927 and worked as a research assistant at MGH in 1930, studying pulmonary embolus and pulmonary embolectomy. Uh, during his time there, he was asked to follow a patient that was status post-cholecystectomy uh, with a suspected PE and planned for pulmonary embolectomy uh, if she had reached extremis, again, because the surgical risk was so high. And so, uh, as part of his care, he monitored vitals every 15 minutes overnight and slowly noted increasing venous distension and cyanosis and ultimately dangerous decrements in blood pressure, at which point he alerted the surgery team. Now, unfortunately, this patient did not survive after going to the OR, but it really did spur Dr. Gibbon to say, if we could just remove the venous blood, expose it to oxygen, and pull out the carbon dioxide, and put it back into the arterial system, we could hemodynamically support these patients uh, you know, while they undergo whatever operation they need. And as a result, he would essentially dedicate his life to that venture. Uh, pictured here is his Gibbon IBM heart-lung machine, uh, which was made of stainless steel and weighed over 2,000 pounds. The oxygenator in this case was comprised of six enclosed steel screens with blood flowing down the sides, uh, which would expose that blood to oxygen, and uh, forwards about seven meters squared of uh, <clears throat> surface area for gas exchange, as opposed to the 70 or 80 meters squared that we have in our native lungs. But again, achieves 100% oxygen saturation and flows up to five liters per minute. And thus, in May of 1953, uh, he was able to use this uh, cardiopulmonary bypass apparatus uh, to perform a ASD closure on an 18-year-old female with right-sided heart failure. Now, pictured here, the notes actually taken reportedly by his wife, uh, who witnessed the procedure. And uh, the complications depend on where you look, uh, but included black blood foaming and oozing from the circuit. Uh, some of the oxygenator screens were completely devoid of blood altogether. Uh, the pressure in the circuit was going up and down precipitously, and there was just a massive amount of blood loss. Despite this, uh, the procedure technically was a success, and Dr. Gibbon would go on to say, after we finally got ready, it was ridiculously easy. So how do you get from cardiopulmonary bypass to VA ECMO? Well, you really have to fast forward 20 plus years to the work being done by Dr. Donald Hill and his successful cannulation support of this 24-year-old male who suffered a traumatic thoracic aortic injury with resultant ARDS the results of which would be published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1972. Now, working at the same time on uh, extracorporeal circulation and support is Dr. Bartlett, uh, who would soon become a major figure in ECMO history. Uh, his contribution specifically revolved around the development of a sustainable membrane oxygenator, uh, which would allow for prolonged runs of extracorporeal uh, circulation support. He would ultimately return to the University of Michigan in 1980 and help form the Extracorporeal Life Source Organization in 1989. But perhaps what he's best known for is the case of orphaned Esperanza, uh, which was the first successful newborn supported on ECMO uh, 
uh, for about a week in the context of ARDS. Now, pictured here is Esperanza at 21 years of age, uh, survived and uh, did quite well. And the membrane oxygenator that Dr. Bartlett helped develop would go on to help support uh, hundreds of newborns uh, in the setting of respiratory failure, after which he was aptly dubbed the godfather of ECMO. <clears throat> As you can imagine, multiple iterations uh, would ensue on uh, Dr. Bartlett's uh, circuit oxygenator, as well as a number of the other machines I've already listed. And as a result, research started to pour out, uh, particularly in the setting, and at least initially, of uh, acute respiratory failure, ARDS, uh, on the efficacy of ECMO in uh, affecting survival rates uh, when compared to standard cares alone. And that research course was really serpiginous and marred by conflicting results on that efficacy. Uh, though ultimately culminated in the more contemporary trials, uh, Caesar and Eolia, which were published in 2009 and 2014, respectively, which, uh, in conjunction with the H1N1 flu epidemic in 2008 and 2009, uh, really led to an explosion in ECMO use for respiratory failure. <clears throat> Meanwhile, cardiopulmonary resuscitation uh, utilization of ECMO was also starting to grow, uh, certainly in part thanks to both of these highly cited or frequently cited rather propensity matched observational trials, uh, the first being prospective and the latter being retrospective, but both showing a, a significant decrease in uh, risk of mortality uh, with neurologically functional favorable survival at 30 days and one year for the first trial, uh, which was set in Taiwan, and the latter trial as well set in Seoul, Korea. Both of these trials, again, while being observational, uh, which is certainly a limitation of the data that we have thus far on uh, VIAC mus is, um, you know, all, or at least allowed or contributed to the significant increase in uh, ECMO runs for adults uh, with about a 1,200% increase in the last decade. And why has ECMO grown to become so popular uh, beyond the fact that it's kind of a new technology and we like new things? Well, First and foremost, ECMO provides full biventricular circulatory support as well as oxygenation support, uh, which is unique to ECMO. Uh, furthermore, it is a great modality for correction of acid-base abnormalities, as well as re uh, rapid rewarming in the context of uh, severe hypothermia. <clears throat> and furthermore, the site of cannulation is becoming more and more ubiquitous. Uh, so you see reports of cannulation in the emergency departments, in the OR, in the cath lab, and sometimes even in the Louvre. <clears throat> what is ECMO? You know, let's get down to brass tacks. ECMO is a circuit, and it has four components, which I'll go through. But, you know, akin to what Dr. Gibbon was trying to describe, it essentially pulls blood out of the venous system, passes it through a, a permeable filamentous membrane, which adds oxygen and removes carbon dioxide, and then pumps it back into the body for uh, support. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the four components um, I was mentioning include the pump, the oxygenator, the cannula, and the tubing. So let's start with the pump. Well, historically, we use these roller pumps. Uh, the ECMO circuits of today now have shifted to a centrifugal pump. Uh, which helps mitigate some of the wear and tear that you see with the tubing with the roller pumps, as well as a, you know, some degree of traumatic hemolysis that uh, was more prevalent in the roller pumps than the centrifugal pumps. The oxygenator is perhaps the most important uh, component of the ECMO circuit, and uh, traditionally was made of silicone rubber, uh, which acted as an okay medium for gas exchange, but has since been replaced by hollow polymethyl pentene fibers, uh, which are stacked on each other and really act as excellent modems for gas exchange and also have really low resistance to blood flow, uh, which as you can imagine also helps mitigate traumatic hemolysis, uh, but also uh, staves off this plasma leak phenomenon that you would uh, see with earlier oxygenators. To control the amount of oxygenation uh, or saturation that is of the blood, you're really controlling the blood flow through the circuit or adjusting the fraction of inspired of oxygen. <clears throat> to control the amount of carbon dioxide and rate at which that carbon dioxide is extracted from the blood, 
you're adjusting the sweep speed, which is essentially that speed of countercurrent gas flow that you see kind of running through the oxygenator here. Typically attached to the oxygenator is a heater cooler unit, uh, which again, in the setting of extreme hypothermia, can allow for rapid rewarming, or in the context of cardiac arrest, which we'll talk a little bit more specifically about later, uh, can be used for targeted temperature management. The cannula uh, are listed here on the left, uh, typically are uh, 21 to 25 French in size for inflow and 15 to 21 French size for outflow cannula. And that nomenclature inflow and outflow cannula really speak to the circuit itself, okay? The circuit is the boss. So inflow cannula is cannula flowing into the circuit and outflow cannula is flowing out of the circuit to the body. The tubing here is about three-eighths to a half inch in diameter and covalently bonded to heparin, uh, which effectively decreases the inflammatory process and complement activation that we can see in these patients, uh, which also helps stave off thrombosis. Pictured here are a couple different uh, cannulation strategies or modalities. Uh, really, these falling into two major buckets, peripheral and central. Peripheral is listed here on the left and is probably what we see most often upstairs in the ICU, uh, but uh, typically includes bifemoral cannulation. In the center, you see an example of central cannulation, which is defined as having at least one cannula entering or exiting the thoracic cavity. And advantage of this is you can uh, essentially supply forward flow uh, instead of retrograde flow up the aorta, which you see here in the peripheral cannulation configuration. Um, so that's hemodynamically favorable, and we'll get to why here in a moment. Uh, and also, as you can imagine, you're essentially eliminating the risk of peripheral vascular damage, uh, albeit uh, at the cost of increased risk of sternal dehiscence and infection and bleeding. The figure on the right here is uh, called sport mode, uh, which is also pictured here. <laughs> but in all reality, it has been a great addition to uh, the configuration options available to us, uh, particularly in those patients that require prolonged runs of ECMO. You know, these patients uh, can be on ECMO for weeks and are combating uh, critical illness myopathy. And by allowing them to mobilize uh, you know, we're decreasing that risk and the associated uh, comorbidities or morbidity rather uh, that is associated with such. I particularly like this picture on this left uh, hand side. This gentleman looks like he's determined to outlive us all. <clears throat> Here are a couple different, uh, you know, schemas or strategies uh, for cannulation, the bottom two being, you know, more of our traditional VA ECMO. Uh, but this is also a um, scenario in which nomenclature and understanding that nomenclature is important. So when you're talking about VVA or VAV or some permutation of either, uh, once you hit the A, once you've reached that A, reading left to right, as we should, uh, you're talking about outflow cannula. So in the example up here on the top left, you have VVA. So you have two venous inflow cannulas and a single arterial outflow cannula. VAV, which is a helpful uh, configuration when you're dealing with something called Harlequin syndrome, uh, which we'll get to here in a moment, uh, has a single venous inflow cannula and then two outflow cannulas. So you're really providing oxygenated blood to both the arterial system and the venous system. And depending on your clinical scenario, uh, particularly in this context, if the cardiac function improves or recovers prior to the lungs recovering, VAV can be a good option for you. Okay, so we've gone through the basics of VA ECMO and we've talked about its history. Why don't we review the hemodynamics of cardiogenic shock and VA ECMO? So cardiogenic shock, as we all know, is a state of persistent hypotension with inadequate response to volume replacement and clinical features of end organ hypoperfusion. So this can be altered mental status or oliguria, typically giving you this cold and wet kind of uh, physiologic picture. Hemodynamically, this can be corroborated by systolic blood pressure less than 90, uh, cardiac index less than 2.2, and a wedge pressure greater than 24, in the presence or absence of balloon pump, usually with vasopressors or inotropes on board. Now, this is a semi-recently released uh, schema, which has also been endorsed by 
uh, ACC and SKY, uh, which really breaks cardiogenic shock into different clinical stages in an effort to provide some sort of template for when you should really be implement, implementing certain therapies, whether that be vasopressors or inotropes or devices. And unfortunately, unlike the food pyramids that we grew up with, it does not get sweeter as you go to the top. Uh, specifically, there has been a review in the literature uh, and analyzing the utility of this schema in uh, real world patients showing an increase in mortality as you kind of climb that ladder towards extremis. Uh, with mortality rates getting up to 67%. Now, let me pause for a moment because I would bring shame to my heart failure attendings if I didn't speak for a few minutes on pressure volume loops and the importance of understanding them when caring for these critically ill patients. So if you don't look at these every day or have never seen one before, bear with me. Uh, this is your PV loop at steady states, and each pressure volume loop really represents a single cardiac cycle. You have pressure here on the y-axis and volume on the x-axis. And we'll start here at point one, which is end isovolumic relaxation. Now, moving from point one to point two, during diastole, the mitral valve opens and the left ventricle fills with blood until it is maximally filled at point two. What follows is isovolumic contraction from point two to point three. Once you've reached point three, the pressure in the left ventricle exceeds that of the pressure in the aorta. The aortic valve opens and you have flow out of the LD into the aorta from 0.3 to 0.4 during systole. The difference between the end diastolic uh, volume and the end systolic volume is your stroke volume. And the area here shaded in gray is your stroke work. This line here or curve uh, <clears throat> represented by Emax is your load independent contractility. And EA is your effective arterial elastance, which is a barometer closely related to afterload. So now that we understand steady states, let's talk a little bit more about what happens with acute MI and cardiogenic shock. In the setting of acute MI, as you can imagine, your load independent contractility curve drops. As a result, you have increases in left ventricular end diastolic volume and pressure, which is what we see when we drop a pigtail at the end of our uh, coronary PCI cases. And subsequently, you have a decrease in your stroke volume. Cardiogenic shock is essentially acute MI on steroids. You have a significant decrement in your load independent contractility. You have a rightward shift of your entire pressure volume loop curve with a concomitant decrease in your stroke volume and elevations and left ventricular pressures and volumes uh, with that relationship essentially being heightened uh, the further right you go. What happens with devices? Well, with balloon pump, by nature of how it works, you have a slight decrease in the arterial elastance. You know, you're decreasing that afterload, which is why we use it as a modality for left ventricular decompression. Your load independent contractility doesn't really change much, and that much is true for LVAD and ECMO, but you do increase the stroke volume just a little bit. Again, kind of smaller changes, but sometimes it might be enough. In the setting of LVAD, you're bypassing the left ventricle, right? You're pulling blood out of the apex and dumping it into the aorta. And so as a result, your pressure volume loop curve really shifts to the left, you have significant decreases in left ventricular pressure and volume, which can be hemodynamically favorable in a heart that just can't do the work on its own. And then finally, ECMO in the world of PV loops can sometimes be viewed as a necessary evil in that the hemodynamic changes in this regard uh, can sometimes be unfavorable in that when you see the arterial elastance that increases, which makes sense, right? Particularly in the setting of peripheral cannulation, again, which is what we see most often, you're providing a countercurrent flow to the natural blood flow down the descending aorta. Consequently, your stroke volume decreases a little bit in your LV pressure and volume increase. And that, in the setting of cardiogenic shock or acute MI or cardiac arrest, can be unfavorable. It can increase left ventricular distension, uh, it can result in supply-demand mismatch issue, issues and ongoing ischemia, especially if there's unaddressed coronary disease. 
and it can uh, lead to backward flow in the way of pulmonary edema or this phenomenon we call ECMO lung. That effect is further corroborated or supported by what happens when you continue to crank up the ECMO flow uh, without dealing with those side effects. As you see, moving to the right, you're going from 1.5 to 3 to 4.5 liters per minute. You know, you're slowly shifting up this pressure volume curve. You're increasing the effective arterial elastance and your stroke volume is dropping. We see this all the time upstairs. And so how do we deal with it? Well, we decompress the left ventricle. Okay, we decompress the left ventricle. And how do we do that? Well, there are a couple different strategies. You can try and increase forward flow, either by the use of inotropes or titration of such. You can implement impella. Uh, you can decrease the preload, either by diuresis or ultrafiltration. Try and decrease the afterload, uh, like in the example we saw with the balloon pump. You can try and, try and titrate the ECMO down, uh, so turning down the flow as long as it doesn't affect your uh, mean arterial pressure. Or you can uh, think about me mechanical decompression, either by transeptal cannulation or atrial septostomy or LV apical venting, which is uh, pictured here in this figure. All right, we know the basics. We've looked at the hemodynamics. Let's talk about the objectives, indications, and contraindications to ECMO use in eCPR. If you leave today with nothing else, please leave with this. ECMO is a bridge. Just like any bridge you see, it can't be a bridge to nowhere, okay? It should be a bridge to something. And that something is listed here and further illustrated in this table in that it can be a bridge to recovery, right? It can buy you time while you're waiting to see if organs are going to recover, which bleeds a little bit into the bridge to decision, right? After, you know, a patient suffers some sort of catastrophic event, you're trying to determine, you know, are they going to recover? Is this end organ going to recover? You can bridge to a more durable bridge in the way of durable mechanical support like LVAD, or you can bridge to transplant. But all these things are bridging to something, right? Just incredibly important to keep in mind because it helps your decision making and should I put this patient on ECMO? If they're not a candidate for any of these things, they probably shouldn't go on ECMO. Here's some common indications, though uh, certainly not all encompassing. Cardiac arrest uh, in the way of eCPR, which we'll get to here shortly. Acute MI, myocarditis, failure to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass, graft failure rejection. Here are some contraindications, uh, some relative and some absolute. Uh, end -store stage organ failure or uh, disease, so a history of ESRD or metastatic cancer. Uh, end stage heart failure without option for transplant or durable mechanical support. Again, that kind of bridge to nowhere concept. Pools of care scenarios, I mean, this is incredibly important and why we loop our palliative medicine team in from day one to sit down with families and say, you know, is this something that they would want if you know, they're sitting here with you know, me and your family? Um, you know, we wanna make sure we're doing everything right by the patient and this plays a large role in helping determine who is a candidate for ECMO and who should continue to be on ECMO support. Uh, some of the other things listed, again, contraindication, systemic anticoagulation, aortic dissection, severe peripheral vascular disease, all important things to keep in mind when uh, you know, assessing these patients up front. Some predictors of morbidity and mortality that have borne out in the literature thus far, older age, longer support time, higher lactate concentrations, COPD, uh, renal failure, requiring CRT, hepatic failure. Now, let's shift gears a little bit and hone in specifically on eCPR. eCPR is defined as extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation and is really used in the context of refractory cardiac arrest, which in general can be defined as sustained cardiac arrest without return of spontaneous circulation, despite usual AHA ACLS cares, including shock if appropriate, and antiarrhythmic use. Now, the two definitions at the bottom are critically important and have been shown to be such in the literature in improving the chances of neurologically favorable survival. And those are no flow time and low flow time. No flow time being time from arrest to CPR initiation and low flow time being time from CPR initiation to VA ECMO cannulation. Both incredibly important. Here are the general steps to uh, eCPR. Um, from start to finish, you know, certainly with uh, some variety in the middle. 
Uh, but you start with activation, then cannulation. Following cannulation, the real work begins in the CICU. Uh, weaning, if they can, and if they can't, consideration for, you know, what are we bridging to? Maybe that's transplants or LVAD. If you're bridging to nothing, or if you're bridging to decision and the patient does not recover, then maybe withdrawal of care. If you're able to wean the patient off of the circuit, then decannulation and hopefully ultimately discharge. Okay, we know the objectives. Let's talk a little bit specifically about MHI's approach to eCPR management and its brief experience and its use. So I'm gonna just step through kind of some of the stages that I had listed on the prior slide, but in the way of activation, the inclusion criteria here include bystander CPR within five minutes of arrest. You have to be 18 to 75 years old. You have to have a transfer from scene to MHI time of less than 30 minutes for cannulation and a total CPR time of less than 60 minutes. Exclusion criteria list a couple of the things that we mentioned before, DNR, DNI order, or known terminal illness that again would be a contraindication for moving forward. And this team is really working under the same mantra as the level one activation team that we use for STEMI protocols. And that time is myocardium. And we wanna cannulate these patients as soon as possible, which in part is you know, having a good activation team, which is in part in discussing with EMS providers the importance of you know, getting these patients on the reg and transporting them in here in an emergent fashion, uh, also that they can get upstairs and we can you know, begin the recovery process and the support process on VA ECMO. All the while, as you can imagine, uh, appropriate ACLS care should ensue, these including mechanical CPR with Lucas device, uh, which occurs in all patients uh, taken care of here. And all patients are also cooled externally and then just general labs are sent off in preparation for cannulation. I mentioned the different locations that cannulation can occur. At MHI, it exclusively occurs in the cath lab, with configuration being uh, the vast majority of cases by femoral cannulation. We use ultrasound and fluoroscopic guidance. I mentioned the size of the cannula that are typically used. All patients receive a heparin bolus prior to initiation of flow. We stop and say, you know, would this patient benefit from revascularization? Certainly the case in the context of acute MI, uh, STEMI or NSTEMI or high suspicion for that being the you know, original etiology for refractory cardiac arrest. And then a distal perfusion catheter can be placed. Uh, I think originally was placed in all patients, uh, but now being placed only in those that show either a peripheral saturation level less than 50% or 20% less than the contralateral limb. And this distal perfusion catheter is placed in the same limb that your inflow, uh, or excuse me, your outflow arterial cannula is sitting in. As you can imagine, this countercurrent uh, blood flow in this large cannula sitting in your uh, lower limb artery can effectively occlude or decrease the uh, forward flow down the rest of the limb, which can lead to ischemic complications, et cetera. Once you've cannulated successfully, we move on to CICU management. And our shock team at MHI is comprised of advanced heart failure doctors, cardiothoracic surgeons, vascular surgeons, interventional cardiology, uh, with a couple of their specific roles listed here. Uh, the advanced heart failure team, you know, certainly acts as the quarterback for this, uh, <clears throat> for this squad, though I do want to highlight the perfusionists and nursing staff as they really act as the front line in caring for these patients and are just so critically important in you know, identifying possible complications, updating appropriate providers on what's going on throughout the day, and really helping us achieve success when caring for these critically ill folks. Uh, so hats off to them. Complications, which I alluded to earlier, can include limb ischemia, vascular complications, stroke, bleeding, infection, and then that notion of Harlequin syndrome, uh, which I was speaking to earlier when I was discussing the merits of VAV uh, cannulation. So again, this can occur when you, know, you have ARDS or fulminant respiratory failure, and then you also have cardiac failure necessitating the implementation of VA ECMO. Well, over time, sometimes the heart recovery um, you know, beats the recovery of the lungs in that you have improvement in you know, load-independent contractility or intrinsic cardiac function, uh, 
which essentially pushes deoxygenated blood, right? Because the lungs really aren't doing much in the way of oxygenating the blood. Uh, pushes deoxygenated blood down the descending thoracic aorta and thus shifts this kind of mixing cloud of oxygenated blood from the circuit and deoxygenated blood coming from the native heart uh, further down the thoracic aorta. As a result, you start to get deoxygenated blood towards the brain and the upper limbs. You get this kind of you know, blue up top and red on the bottom, Harlequin-like syndrome, um, which can be mitigated by a couple different strategies. One, you can try to increase the ECMO flow a little bit, understanding the effects that you're going to have on the pressure volume loop and maybe lead to left ventricular distension and the side effects that come along with that. Or you can add a return cannula, an additional outflow cannula, to the right side of the heart. So you're having oxygenated blood flow into the right side, pass through the lungs. Again, the lungs aren't really doing anything, but the vasculature is still there. Dumping into the left ventricle and then exiting the left ventricle. So you're having oxygenated blood reach the upper extremities and the brain. Weaning. Weaning is considered after about a day of hemodynamic stability, and if there's presence of a pulse pressure over 20. Uh, we use echocardiographic criteria and a Swan-Gans catheter to help guide us. All patients get heparin during the weaning process, a heparin bolus. And flow is weaned about 0.5 to 1 liter every five minutes with serial imaging and serial recording of what, you know, our biventricular systolic function looks like, what the you know, left ventricular dimensions look like, uh, valvular assessment is critically important, and then hemodynamic data in the way of pulmonary pressures, cardiac output, et cetera. Patients will move forward with decannulation if they maintain a MAP over 60 and have an ejection fraction over 20%, or at least around 20%, with a cardiac index that's preserved on about moderate, you know, inotrope and vasopressor support. If during the weaning process, you have a decrement in your MAP, uh, you want to abort and reassess. And if the patient is ECMO dependent after five days, we usually start thinking hard about LVAD uh, or whether or not they would be a candidate for transplant. <clears throat> now, thanks to Dr. Renowitz and our wonderful MHIF research team, I'm able to present some of MHI's data on its experience thus far with ECPR. And as, or at least in context, or for some context rather, uh, MHI sees over 70 out-of-hospital non-traumatic cardiac arrests per year. And between 2012 and 2017, 26 patients were uh, essentially enrolled in our ECPR protocol uh, with eight of those arrests occurring in the cath lab, 11 in hospital, and seven out of hospital. And again, these are refractory cardiac arrest patients. The average age was 59, with 65% of these patients being male, and traditional risk factors being prevalent, as you can imagine, and as listed here. <clears throat> all of these patients suffered witnessed cardiac arrest. They all underwent bystander CPR. Initial rhythm was ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia in 65% of all patients and 83% of survivors compared to 25% of non-survivors. And time from arrest to ECMO flow was 51 minutes uh, for the entire cohort, 46 minutes in those that survived with a longer time in those that did not. 17 patients were revascularized at the time of cannulation seven of whom had arrested in the cath lab. 30-day and six-month survival was 69%, the majority of which had a CPC score of one or two, so neurologically functionally uh, favorable. 69% of patients required greater than three units of blood in a 24-hour period, and only 23% suffered major vascular complications requiring surgical intervention. Here are the CAM survival curves uh, with, for the entire cohort, uh, which is 69%, and then broken down into site of arrest with 88% uh, survival in the cath lab group, 71% out of hospital, and 55% in hospital. And just for some context and comparative purposes, I want to highlight a few other groups' experiences uh, 
with the caveat that this is not comparing apples to apples, right? Each center really has kind of different uh, inclusion criteria and protocols for caring these, for these patients, uh, but really we're relying a lot on observational data uh, in this setting because it's all we have thus far. And so with that being said, our first two groups, uh, Avali and Hanea, published their five-year experiences uh, with eCPR in the context of refractory cardiac arrest with 18 and 26 out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients, respectively, in a mixture of initial rhythm being VF or VT, uh, with an out-of-hospital survival rate somewhere between 5 and 15%, and an in-hospital cardiac arrest survival rate around 45%. Comparatively, uh, Stubb et al. in 2015 published their experience over a three-year period with all patients being cannulated in the emergency department and all patients suffering from a VF or VT event as their initial rhythm. Out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival here was 45%, and in-hospital cardiac arrest was 60%. Now, Dr. Yiannopoulos and the University of Minnesota with their Minnesota Resuscitation uh, Consortium published their data uh, on their one-year experience with cannulation occurring in the cath lab. Again, all patients uh, suffering VF or VT as initial rhythm with an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival rate of 45%, with 42% having a CPC score of one or two. I think the biggest thing you can draw from this table and the comparisons is the variability in results and the fact that we just don't know who the best patient is yet that should undergo this eCPR protocol. This is how our data has shaken out so far with just a few important caveats to keep in mind when interpreting that data. First and foremost, this is a very small sample size of 26 patients, and it's incredibly difficult to determine whether or not these results would continue to be sustained with a larger cohort. We've had about 75 or 76 patients since 2017 undergo eCPR here at MHI with a survival rate around 44%, no lower than initial experience, though certainly not unexpected, and still higher than the averages uh, seen across the nation. All of these patients suffered witnessed cardiac arrest. Again, that's critically important. You know, some of these uh, experiences don't stipulate whether the arrest was witnessed or not, and if they do, you know, it usually pretends to the fact that they've received some sort of bystander CPR, again, decreasing that no flow and low flow time, which we've already discussed, is so critically important in improving neurologically functional favorable survival. Speaking to that, all these patients underwent bystander CPR, which again, you know, makes them even more selected. And beyond that fact, all but one received immediate bystander CPR that patient receiving CPR after three minutes of downtime, so still within the five minutes that we uh, deem necessary for inclusion. That essentially eliminates that no-flow time. There was a large number of cath lab arrests in this cohort where arterial access is already obtained, and thus cannulation can occur efficiently, and revascularization can subsequently occur if indicated. And then again, our inclusion criteria. While strict in that, you know, these patients uh, should receive bystander CPR within five minutes, et cetera. Still only 26 patients were enrolled over a five-year period or were deemed you know, appropriate for eCPR. And that really speaks to the subjectivity and the selection bias and that we rely heavily on our shock team's uh, determination and eyeball test on you know, who is going to be a great candidate for eCPR and who maybe won't be. And the hope is as the cohort grows, we can retrospectively look back and say, you know, these factors were critical in determining, you know, which patients fly on ECMO and which don't. In an effort to hopefully standardize that decision-making process and replicate the results that MHI has seen thus far. As with all new therapies, larger multi-center randomized trials are needed. Um, the randomized part is certainly ongoing. I don't know if there are any multi-center trials just yet, because uh, you can imagine it's such a difficult thing to study given the time dependence of decision-making, et cetera. So circling back to our young uh, Taekwondo instructor, you know, she's en route to the cath lab. She has no pulse uh, and uh, no perfusing rhythm. We have no more tricks in our ACLS algorithm. Certainly a, con or a case where we would think about the utility of VA ECMO or ECPR. In the cath lab, she was found to have 
critical high-grade stenosis in the left main LED and near complete occlusion in the left circumflex with concern for spontaneous coronary artery dissection uh, with some concomitant thrombosis. Thrombectomy was attempted, though unfortunately complicated by perforation of the left circumflex, which is shown here in this kind of blush of dye you see above the circumflex artery. This was subsequently treated with a 3 by 20 balloon. And as you can see, the Lucas device is still running. We have yet to achieve an, a, a perfusing rhythm uh, or ROSC. And thus the decision was made to proceed with ECPR cannulation on VA ECMO. Uh, here on your right, you see the, uh, <clears throat> the peripheral cannulation occurring uh, with the, um, the uh, perfusion catheter being placed in the same limb that the arterial catheter cannula is being placed in. Attention subsequently was turned back to the coronaries. Since now we've cannulated, we've achieved a map of 65, shortly after which we achieved a perfusing rhythm, albeit the cardiac function, which you can tell even here on these angiographic images, is quite poor. A covered stent was placed in that left circumflex artery to manage the perforation. And further revascularization was really deferred in the context or concern of propagation of that uh, dissection down the remainder of the coronary tree. Here's the patient's post-PCI CT. Uh, as you can see, there's already evidence of you know, fulminant uh, pulmonary opacities bilaterally with you know, likely development of ARDS down the line. And also just a nice picture of your venous uh, cannula placement, which usually uh, resides within the right atrium uh, or at the SVC RA junction. Post-PCI uh, ECG shows those Q waves that we noted on initial uh, EMS strip. <clears throat> now in sinus, still has some persistent ST elevation in the high lateral leads and kind of diffuse ischemic changes uh, elsewhere. Here's our post-PCI echocardiogram. You know, no surprise here, we already saw it on the angiogram. Uh, the LV function is severely reduced. The RV actually is uh, pretty decompressed in this setting, uh, which is not uncommon in the context of you know, immediate VA ECMO cannulation in that these patients just need a lot of fluid. Here's our hospital course. Uh, troponin peaked at 950. She developed non-oligaric renal failure requiring CRT, ARDS, shock liver, DIC. She had compartment syndrome requiring bilateral fasciotomies and cerebellar stroke with really unclear neurologic status. As you can imagine, and as we spoke about earlier, palliative is so critical in these patients. And we sat down both with the palliative team and the family members and said, look, you know, prognosis is extremely guarded in this situation. And you know, while we're seeing maybe some recovery in some areas, uh, we're certainly not out of the woods. Hospital day 11, she was opening her eyes, but not really tracking. But hospital day 13, she squeezed someone's hand with a little bit of light and sedation. And miraculously, by day 15, she was reliably following commands. Again, extensive discussions with family. You know, these are promising signs, but has end organ you know, failure, uh, is still requiring a lot of support. Ultimately, she underwent LVAD placement on hospital day 31 uh, with concomitant decannulation at that time and went from unable to achieve ROSC to discharging to Courage Kenny on hospital day 71. And in June of 2015, she got a heart transplant. She was seen in clinic sometime in the last couple months, was doing really well is working independent and has no cardiac func or no cardiac symptoms, excuse me, plenty of cardiac function uh, <clears throat> at this time. So certainly anecdotal, but powerful. It shows you, you know, what this technology can do when applied to the right case. So in conclusion, we went through the basics of VA ECMO and its history. We went over the hemodynamics of cardiogenic shock in VA ECMO. We talked about the common objectives, indications, and contraindications to VA ECMO use in eCPR. And we also highlighted MHI's approach to eCPR management and experience. Thank you. Do you have questions from the audience, Jones?
not yet, but feel free to submit questions via the Q&A pod located at the bottom of your screen. Can I ask one thing before we wait? That was superb. It really was very clearly presented, and uh, uh, I compliment you. Thank you. Um, you know, when you look at the 26 patients that you presented from our experience, uh, and the, I'm, that table went by me pretty fast, but um, how many of the survivors had um, asystole or PEA versus uh, like a shockable rhythm? Did, was there a difference there? And then how many of those 26 were, were in acute ST elevation MI? Yep. So to answer your first question, um, the percentages here, and again, sorry, I clicked through somewhat quickly, uh, those patients, so out of the entire cohort, uh, mm -hmm. nine patients or 35% had PA or asystole, okay, mm -hmm. and, and three of those patients survived to discharge. Now, you know, historically, we look at ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia as a, you know, shockable rhythm, as in there's hopefully some sort of reversible cause. Now, that's, you know, not saying that you can't have some sort of myocardial scar burden from a prior, you know, CAD related event, et cetera. Uh, but the hope is in this context, as you're alluding to, that, you know, there's something to fix from a coronary standpoint. And, uh, you know, I think in the literature, we've seen a trend, you know, in the patients that actually get revascularization, appropriate revascularization for acute lesions and not just, well, you know, there's maybe a stenosis here that could have contributed. You know, those patients tend to do better. But really, at the end of the day, it's all about what goes on upstairs. Right. We, you know, think we manage a lot of things uh, and have, you know, a lot of impact on increasing the chances of neurologically functionally favorable survival and, you know, quicker cannulation, revascularizing when indicated, et cetera. But, you know, the brain is still somewhat of a black box. You know, we're trying to cool, we're trying to, uh, you know, get the brain as much oxygen as quickly as possible in the way of, you know, decreasing low flow and no flow times. Uh, but the reality is, even if you have PA or asystole, um, it all depends on, you know, how the brain does at the end of the day. And that's what, you know, oftentimes we're waiting to see we'll recover. Now, the differences between, um, <clears throat> between VF and VT bear out a little bit here in, uh, you know, our small cohort of 26, but I imagine it would be even more pronounced if we look back in the addition of the 75 patients or so that we've had cannulated in the ECPR protocol since 2017. Um, Oh, yes. To your second question, um, I think the actually a large number of this cohort were STEMI or NSTEMI. Uh, I don't think a huge amount were STEMI. I think certainly a lot more NSTEMI, as you can imagine, than STEMI. I can't quote the exact number, but I can get back to you after this conference. Yes. Patient, you presented one of these. Ones. Yes. We have one online question so far, and it is, what is the role of hypothermia? That's a great question. Um, you know, as I was mentioning, it's really all about brain recovery and preserving uh, neurologic function in this context. And so in our cohort, we cool all patients if we can, if, you know, unless there's some absolute contraindication to not cooling. And I think targeted temperature management has been shown to be most effective in those patients that suffer cardiac arrest with a, you know, <clears throat> shockable rhythm in the way of VT or VF, though the results have been conflicting historically in the literature on its efficacy in those patients that suffer from PA or asystole. Regardless, I think if they can hemodynamically tolerate it, we try to be as aggressive as possible, um, just in that, you know, we want to give the brain the best chance it can to uh, recover under these circumstances. Thank you. Uh, another question from Dr. Burke is, has anyone considered extending the time for CPR if the patient is receiving CPR with Lucas? Yeah, that's a good question. So we use Lucas device ubiquitously here. I think in the literature, it hasn't borne out uh, clinically to show you know, much in the way of difference from survivability standpoints. I think uh, experimentally, it does or has been shown to improve the amount of oxygenated blood or uh, brain oxygenation that you see. Uh, but again, that's in the experimental context. I don't know if there's been discussion about, you know, lengthening the amount of time from CPR to cannulation for the criteria standpoint. Uh, though certainly, I mean, just like any guideline or criteria, there can be discussion, right? You, we can all agree that this patient is out of protocol. Um, you know, even though they may be five minutes outside of our technical protocol, boy, they came and said, I'm having chest pain, I'm having chest pain. The suspicion for underlying, you know, acute 
you know, coronary syndrome is quite high. We think this is something that we can treat. We think this is something that's reversible. Um, so that's a good point in that it also brings up, you know, maybe a little bit of flexibility in that context to say, you know, while this patient doesn't perfectly meet uh, criteria, you know, we think they'd be a good candidate for eCPR anyway. Thank you.